Honorable Nigel Farage. Thank you. Well, Becky Heritage, thank you very much for inviting not just me, but a delegation um, of politicians from across Europe here today. Uh, and of course, I come from Europe, and as you will know, because Obama keeps telling you this, and the State Department keep telling you this, and in fact, too much of the American media keep telling you this, everything in Europe is going wonderfully well. <laughs> There is absolutely nothing to worry about at all. The Eurozone is a fantastic success, and there are lots of American voices urging, and also American businesses, including Goldman Sachs. I'm sure there are one or two Goldman Sachs fans in the room. They, of course, were the people that cooked the books and earned a fortune to get Greece to qualify for being a Eurozone member. But we keep getting this message in Britain and in Europe that the Americans think everything's going swimmingly, and Obama keeps saying publicly that Greece must stay in the Euro, oh, and of course, that Britain must stay inside the European Union. I thought what I'd do uh, to begin with this morning is perhaps bring you up to date as to why that opinion may not quite be right. The very issue that got me into politics, and remember, I actually had a proper job before being in politics, which is pretty unusual these days, but I was a commodity broker and trader, and the issue that got me into politics was an evening back in 1990 when the Conservative government in Britain signed us up to the exchange rate mechanism. They effectively pegged sterling against the Deutschmark as a precursor to us joining what became the Euro. And I was opposed to that, and I've been opposed to the uh, European single currency project ever since. It was clear and utter madness to think that Germany and Greece could coexist together inside the same economic and monetary union. And there are some of us that have been making these arguments clearly for over 15 years. But the European project, which was being pushed in those days by Chancellor Cole and by President Mitterrand, they had decided that what they were going to do was to build a United States of Europe. It was going to have a flag, an anthem, a president, who I, who I thought I welcomed rather nicely on his first uh, occasion in the Parliament. Um, I, and it was going to become a new global superpower. And that superpower was necessary because America could not go unchallenged on the world stage. And whenever those people who were the architects of this were questioned about detail, were questioned about practicality, they just said, don't bother us with the details. They believed that if you put together an economic and monetary union, that overnight a political union would follow as night follows day. And of course it doesn't work, and the analysis that we all had 15 years ago has been right. The only way that Germany and Greece can coexist together inside the same economic and monetary union is if the Greeks become like the Germans, or the Germans become like the Greeks. And it ain't going to happen. The the other point of the European project, apart from wanting to be a global superpower, was that it was designed to bring together the warring nations of Europe. And actually, if you think about it, the idea of getting the French and Germans around the table to share dinner and break bread in the 1950s was an entirely sensible thing to do. The idea that if people trade more with each other, they're, le they're less likely to fight each other was, again, an entirely sensible idea. Sadly, it's gone too far. And I now feel that this European project of love, cooperation and peace, well, just look at it. Just look at it. You know, Angela Merkel went to visit Athens last year to be greeted by people dressed up in Nazi uniforms. I mean, sort of, you look at it and think, do I laugh at this or do I want to cry at this? I mean, you just look at the language the language that was used in the European Parliament last week by German politicians about the Greeks. So actually, far from Europe coming together with a single currency, actually economically we're diverging, and far from the project bringing everyone together, what we're beginning to see is a return of the old enmities that have done Europe so much harm over the course of the last hundred years and more. The project isn't working. I grew up in a Europe that was divided from east to west by the Berlin Wall. 
and I'm now living in a Europe that is divided north to south by a new Berlin Wall, and that Berlin Wall is called the Euro. Now, the Greeks had a referendum, you might have noticed, two weeks ago, and despite massive threats, despite being told that if they voted no, the power supply would fail, amongst other things, 61% of them said, we can't go on as we are. We can't take further austerity. And yes, it's easy. It's easy for any of us uh, to criticise the Greeks for their financial management and their retirement ages and everything else. But do think about this. You know, when the United States of America had its Great Depression, the sort of buddy, can you spare us a dime times, the, the US economy had contracted from top to bottom about 16%. The Greek economy has now contracted by 26% since 2008. And when we get the fresh figures for this current quarter, bearing in mind the banks have now been closed for almost three weeks, maybe that contraction will be closer to 30%. You know, we are watching a country that's in real trouble. If we, have a, if we have a heart and a soul, we will feel for the suffering of the Greek people. They never voted to join the Euro. They were taken into it by Goldman Sachs and their own greedy politicians. We've got a situation in Greece where now the hospitals are actually running out of medicine. We're witnessing a political experiment that is taking a country and we're watching it literally before our very eyes become a third world country. It is a human tragedy. And yet, in the face of that referendum, what has happened? What has happened is the big institutions of the EU, oh yes, and our friends from Washington, I hadn't yet touched on the International Monetary Fund, who now appear to have become an arm of European government. Just look at their last two leading figures. One, Dominic, Stra Dominic Strauss-Kahn, well, we'll perhaps gloss over that and move on. Um, but Christine Lagarde, you know, a fully paid up member of the Eurocrat class, a fully paid up member of saying everything and anything must be done <coughs> to maintain this project called the Euro. So between the IMF and the European Commission and the European Council, what they have done is to bully Greece, to bully Greece into signing up for a deal whose terms are even harsher than that that was rejected by the Greek people in a referendum. You know, what price democracy, folks, in modern day Europe? Well, it frankly doesn't exist. So that's the first big crisis that Europe faces, and it is perfectly clear to me that the only hope that countries like Greece have got is to find a leader with courage, and I'm sorry, Mr Tsipras doesn't have much courage. You know, he's, he's basically marched the Greek people up to the top of the hill, and then faced with the final uh, big decision has marched them back down again, I am in no doubt that economic and monetary union will not last, that it will break up. The only question is, when will it break up? and just how bad will the social consequences be. <clears throat> I believe Greece uh, going back to the drachma, having a big devaluation, allowing the banks to go bust. Yes, I know it's horrible. Depositors will lose money. But think, this is exactly what Iceland did. Little Iceland, a country of a third of a million people, faced that, that same banking crisis that America faced, that Britain faced, that, that much of the world, with the exception, of course, of Canada and Australia, who had sensible banking rules and didn't need bailouts. But when we all faced this, we bailed out the system, which in many ways was an odd concept uh, within a, 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 a capitalist country. But we bailed out the system. The Icelandics let the banks go bust. The Icelandics allowed their currency to sink. It fell by 80% on the world's exchanges. Inflation went to 30%. Interest rates went to 27%. There was then in 2010 a volcanic eruption, do you remember, and all the planes stopped flying. I mean, it looked like the Old Testament had come back, you know. I mean, it was pretty serious stuff, but now Iceland is back to growth. Now Iceland has just signed her own genuine free trade deal with China. That's the example we have to give uh, to those Mediterranean countries, but to do that, we have to break the stranglehold of the European elites. And there's a second big problem and a and big dilemma that Europe is facing. Uh, and it's something that at the moment nobody has got the courage uh, to own up to and to address. You will all have seen the photographs of the boatloads of migrants coming across the Mediterranean. It may be worth me mentioning that nearly every single one of those boats comes from a place called Libya, 
Weren't we clever getting rid of Colonel Gaddafi? Hasn't that worked out wonderfully? Anyway, Europe has decided that anybody that comes from a war-torn part of North Africa or the Middle East <coughs> must be given the rights to settle. And I am not somebody uh, that would ever want to turn our backs on the idea of giving uh, refuge uh, to people who genuinely are in fear of their lives. After all, I come from a country that you know, said yes to the French Huguenots. My family were French Huguenots, Protestants who were being burned at the stake. You know, uh, we said yes to the Jewish people who came from first from Russia and then, of course, who came from Germany and Austria, a country who said yes to the Ugandan Asians. So we're used to influxes of 5, 10, 15, 20, maybe even as high as 30,000 people seeking refugee status. But the problem, folks, is this. What we're facing coming across the Mediterranean is potentially a migration of genuinely Old, Old Testament biblical proportions. We face potentially millions of people coming across, uh, and that, it, that in itself brings a problem, but there's a bigger problem still, and that's this, that we have no means, we have no ability of checking criminal records or of checking political or religious associations of any of these people. And when IS say they will use this crisis to flood Europe with their own jihadists, I suspect we should believe them. And I think the whole, the, the whole debate on immigration, given that we now have an open door to people from Romania and Bulgaria, people whose uh, minimum wages are 10 times lower than ours, the debate about immigration has been about money. It's been about the shape of communities, but the debate about immigration in Europe certainly is going to get onto the very key issue of security. So in the face of these two massive crises that Europe faces, we have a remarkable change in British politics. We have a Prime Minister who has always been committed to Britain's membership of the European Union. He believes that it's a very good thing. <clears throat> but because of the rise of UKIP, he was forced into making a promise that he never thought he'd have to deliver. The day before the election, you could have gone to Labrooks and you could have got 13 to 2 against a Conservative majority. Indeed, the Prime Minister himself, it is said, at 7 o'clock on election day, went into the study at Chequers and wrote a resignation speech. So we've had this stunning election result. Why? Well, chiefly fear of that appalling woman who comes from north of Hadrian's Wall, um, <laughs> who represents the Scottish National Party, a party who are nationalists and socialists at the same time. <laughs> Did I really say that? Yes, there we are. Um, well, it's true, so to hell with it. Um, it. It was really fear of the SNP uh, that gave the Tories this majority. Um, and so now we have a referendum. Um, and it's not going to be easy, but this referendum matters. And it's important, and it's important for us, because I believe in democracy. I believe in self-government. It's important for us because I think our Supreme Court should be the ultimate arbiter in our land. You know, we, we have a row going on at the moment as to whether prisoners should get the vote. Not a concept that would uh, go very far in America, I don't think. Um, but who decides ultimately whether prisoners get the vote in our electoral system? Well, it won't be our Supreme Court. <clears throat> It'll be the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, and that's unacceptable. It's important for me uh, and for UKIP that we win this referendum because I want to turn immigration from being a negative into being a positive. And that's not very hard. All you have to do is to introduce the Australian-style point system, where you say, we want migrants who've got skills. We want migrants who haven't got criminal records. We want migrants who bring their own health insurance. We want migrants who will not be able to claim anything out of the social security system until they've been with us for five years, paid their taxes, and obeyed the law. So for all of those reasons, <clears throat> I want our side of the argument to win this referendum. But this isn't just about Britain. This referendum is not just about the future of Britain's relationship with Europe. Actually, if we win this referendum, then in short order, there'll be voices in Finland, and in Sweden, and in Denmark, and in Austria, and elsewhere, saying, actually, this is the relationship that we want too. Our vision for Europe, and I've been portrayed you know, over the years as being anti-European, which is absolute nonsense. But I think a better Europe 
would be a Europe of sovereign, democratic nation states that trade together, that cooperate together, more of a NATO model, if you like, for how we work together with neighbours than one of political union where we surrender the supremacy of law. And that's why this referendum matters. It matters because if we can win this referendum, we will effectively kill off the whole project of trying to impose against the will of the peoples of the member states of Europe a new form of undemocratic government. And I want people in America perhaps to understand this rather more than they do at the moment, because as I say, I'm getting a bit tired of the Obama line and the State Department line, and I want people in America to understand this, and this perhaps is, um, I'm now saying this rather more from a British angle <coughs> than from the uh, representative of parties from across Europe that I'm here with today. The relationship between Britain and America has been a very, very important one. Yeah, we had a little bit of a fallout, didn't we, a couple of hundred years ago, and I understand that. Um, but actually, actually, uh, what Britain and America have done together in terms of fighting for the principles of liberty, democracy, and freedom, and they've done that in the face of some of the most evil aggressors in history, and at great price, we've been successful. We are your greatest ally on this planet. But if we lose this referendum, our ability to continue to be your best ally will diminish by the day. There is a plan, and it's already taking shape, to build a European army, a European air force, a European navy is already active in dealing with Somali pirates. <coughs> um, in we have in terms of foreign policy, a European that now has over 160 representative offices around the world. And bit by bit, we see British delegations being withdrawn so that we're represented internationally by the European Union. Uh, we see a UK Treasury who basically think that one of the benefits of being in the EU is we can cut our defence spending every year uh, to levels that frankly don't make us a credible player on the world stage. This referendum will be won or lost, not on the fine uh, academic arguments about trade policy, important though that is. This referendum will be won or lost on the question of who we are as British people and what we want our role in, 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 in the future of the world to be. And we shall be making the strong, positive case that an independent, democratic Britain that controls its borders and is able to act freely on the international stage with our allies when and where we see fit is the right way forward. And it just would be nice if there were one or two voices from the USA who rather agreed with what I've said to you this morning. Please, can we have no more of Obama telling us how good it is for us? Thank you. Thank you.